All right. Well, good morning, y'all, and welcome to worship at Heritage and our Overflow worship service. I want to welcome everybody that's viewing online as well. Glad y'all are here with us. Man, I'm glad to see everybody back on this rainy Palm Sunday. Uh, I just want to remind you while we're in the building, make sure that you have your mask on at all times while you're inside. A um, couple more announcements. We're in need of volunteers right now for ushers, scripture reader, and audio visual. So if anybody is interested in helping with that, uh, you can give Bernice a call in the church office. There, this week there will not be a Wednesday evening table service, but we will have a special Maundy Thursday drive-in service, and we'll have communion on Maundy Thursday out back uh, under the portico and the drive-in space back there. And Scott's Wednesday evening Bible study group will meet like regular on Zoom. Also, for Good Friday, we're going to have a virtual service that's going to be posted on Facebook at um, 9 a.m. Friday morning. So you can view that service at any point throughout the day. And that's also a communion service. And then Easter morning, y'all, here's a big one. We're going to have a 6 o'clock sunrise service. So out back like we usually do, 6 o'clock. And so bring your chair and um, come join us for that at 6. Scott will be preaching that. And then at 10 o'clock, we're going to have our sanctuary service over there in the sanctuary. And then also at 10 o'clock, this overflow service will meet outside in the grassy area. So it's going to be really, uh, we're going to go ahead and claim that it's going to be a pretty day outside because every other day that we've tried to do something like today, outside it pours down rain. But Easter Sunday, it's coming, and we're going to have it outside, hopefully. Uh, and then the following Sunday, April 11th, is when Sunday school classes return to Heritage. So Sunday schools, if you're in a Sunday school class, or if now's a great time to join one if you're not in one, we will be back in the building on the 11th Sunday school at 9 o'clock. So if you need any information on Sunday school classes or if you uh, are in a class, ask your teachers and make sure that you're going to be back. Um, one other quick announcement. We have today, Palm Sunday, so we're going to have the children process in here in a few minutes, and they're going to be waving their palm branches and having fun. They're doing that in the sanctuary here in just a minute. Um, so as you uh, see the kids remember that we're also having an Easter egg hunt after church, and it's a monsoon outside right now, so we're not going to be going outside in the, in the rain, uh, and so we need your help in here. If you would, once the service is over, we need help clearing these chairs out. So if some of y'all can stick around and just stack the chairs, and we're going to, uh, we need to roll some of them up to the narthex because there's tables set up up there for the picnic that was supposed to be outside. Uh, and we'll roll some chairs up there for people to sit in for the Easter egg hunt. And then in here, they're going to be actually hunting eggs in here. So if we can clear the chairs out in here, help move us some up there, we'd really appreciate it. And I'll remind you whenever we close out, because I know we're 30, 40 minutes from doing that. So um, would y'all please bow your heads and join me as we pray together as a church. Father God, we thank you for this time that we are able to come together and worship. We thank you for what Palm Sunday means to us as Christians. And we know that you willingly chose to go to Jerusalem where you would face your death. God, help us remember that during this Palm Sunday through all of the the, the children's stuff going on today remind us that, that you chose to go before us. You chose to go before us knowing what awaited you on the cross, and we thank you for that. God, be with us as we continue to worship today. I pray for Scott as he has uh, the message prepared today that you've put on his heart. We just pray that your Holy Spirit would reign here in our time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
And now if you would, on the screen, we should have the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed is just what we believe. And for generations, the church has come together and said this. And so let's join with millions of other Christians in saying what we believe today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me go ahead and invite Mike Davis up to come read our scripture this morning. morning. Today's scripture comes from Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11. This is the New International Version. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And I want to go ahead and invite y'all to stand with us. As we, uh, as John already said, as we start this morning, um, this is just a reminder of what this week is, of how, of all the joy that we get to have because of this triumphal entry as Jesus enters into Jerusalem um, on his way to Easter Sunday. And so I just want to give you um, the opportunity to to be there in that moment, to celebrate that joy and just to, to worship with that kind of life. As our kids come through here in a minute waving um, the palm branches, I hope it's, it's just a reminder of, of that freedom that we get to have. You know, it's not just in these moments where we have these special reminders, but all the time that we have this kind of freedom and joy and celebration.
it was on. I, I don't know if y'all saw me there, there for a few moments while I was singing. I was doing this, seeing if I could hear. I thought I was hearing my voice through that speaker. Uh, let me just, let me just first be the first to apologize. <laughs> um, they're saying sing a little louder, so that means sing a little louder. So I don't know um, if if that song can't get you excited. I don't know what can um, get you excited um, about raising a hallelujah. Uh, it is so good to be here. Um, this is the beginning of Holy Week, and this is probably the biggest crowd we've had back since um, since the pandemic, I guess. It was about a year ago this week or last week that we went online virtually. Well, today, I don't want to take a long time today, but I, I do have some things I think that can be very beneficial to us. How, how many of y'all like a parade? Okay, half of you do? Okay, good, good, good. You know, uh, we, we've not had, this was probably one of the first parades that we've had at Heritage Church in a long time. Um, our, our, our children bringing in the palm branches, and um, uh, what a joy that was to have them do that. That was... Um, um, a, a, a treat. I had them lay them on the floor because, uh, you know, over in the sanctuary, they put them on the altar and the prayer altar. But over here, I had them lay them on the floor because that's where they were originally laid. They were laid on the ground um, on Palm Sunday. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, so they had this parade and we like parades, Christmas parades, Mardi Gras parades, uh, Halloween parades, I love the parades when I see the adult um, knock over a kid to get like a five cent set of beads, you know. It's something happens to us when we go to parades. Uh, well, this passage that, that Mike read for us today, uh, many of you know it's the Palm Sunday passage. Uh, it's taken from the Gospels. It's where the whole city through Jesus a parade, and we call it the triumphant entry. And what I'm going to talk to you a little bit later, I'm, I'm going to po propose to you that there were two parades on that Palm Sunday. And we're going to look at that here in a few moments. One that we know about and the other that we do not know about. And we're going to look at that um, in a moment. Um, but as Jesus rode in the city, the people out of respect and out of worship uh, threw their coats, their cloaks, um, their palm branches on, on the ground, um, anticipating Jesus' coming. Uh, this day in the life of the church is a day marked where Jesus should be worshiped and praised. We should raise a hallelujah. We should sing a little louder. We should share the message of the love of Christ to the world. You know, we've just finished six weeks of doing the Purpose Driven Life, and we've talked about our purposes and why we're here. And, and, and this sermon today is sort of going to dovetail um, on that. But also, today is a bittersweet day in the life of the church because we know Friday is coming. Jesus will be beaten scores, whipped, spit upon before the end of this week. And he did that for you. And he did that for me. That's why we should worship. That's why we should live for him. That's why we should share the love of Christ with everyone that we come in contact with. The crowd that day was shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And by the end of the week, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It's the triumphant entry. On Friday, they were shouting, give us Barabbas. Let a criminal free. Let a murderer free. Crucify Jesus. Billy Graham said this several times throughout his ministry, one of the greatest evangelists that our world has ever seen. He said this, he said, our mission field today is our local church. Our mission field is the people that are sitting in our pews today. And he went on to say, and he wrote several books on there. There's been several people write books on it. It's because there seems to be a, 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 a 
Christians who, who name the name of Christ who do not live a committed faith. They're not all in. That's what Christ calls us. Christ calls us to be all in. There's a lack of faith, a lack of, 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 of wanting to follow Jesus in every area of our life. And on this Friday, as we come up and celebrate Friday, the crowd was shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And I want to tell you, there's probably many reasons that, that this was happening. The first one is their words didn't match their heart. What was coming out of their mouth really wasn't what they were living. They possessed a casual and not committed faith. They had religion, but they missed the person of Jesus. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? I think it's a description of the church today. Not just Heritage Church, the church in general. And y'all have heard me say this before. You know, a, a lot of times we like to blame, blame our culture for what's going on in, in society. And, 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 and I'm just the opposite. I blame the church for what's going on in society because we refuse to live a committed faith when we leave these four walls. That's what the last six weeks have been talked about, as we've been talking about, is being faithful in every area and, and, and living for your purpose. So I want to just go over with you quickly this morning. So how can we have that committed faith, that type of faith that Christ calls each and every one of us to? How can we have that? None of us are perfect. There's room for improvement in all of our lives and especially our, our spiritual lives. So I want to I share with you three keys this morning that I think that can help us have that committed faith that Christ wants us to have. And when we have that committed faith, we'll see our families change. We'll see our schools change. We'll see our society change. We'll see our world change. It's not impossible because all things are possible through Christ. The first key is this. Key to a committed faith is to be Christ-centered and not self-centered. Sounds obvious. Sounds obvious. In America, we tend to say, hey, God, here's my calendar. Here's my agenda. I'm going to put you here. I don't have time for you here, but I'm going to put you here. That's a very dangerous way to live. That, that's compartmentalizing your relationship with God. And we must not do that. The Christian you are in this room today, the follower of Christ that you are in this room today, should be the type of person that you are when you go to work or go to school, when you go to play, when you go to the ball game. We should live Christ-centered. In our passage that Mike read for us, the people that, that, that welcomed Jesus, praised him, and worshiped him, I think it was mainly for two reasons. First, because of his miracles. Look at what Jesus has done. He'd healed the sick. He'd raised the dead. They praised him because what he was doing and how he was serving them. And the second one is they saw Jesus to be a political deliverer from the Romans. To be set free from Rome as Israel was set free from Egypt. And their praise was tempered with the attitude, Jesus, what can you do? For me, in just a few short days on the calendar of this week, in just a few short days, they saw Jesus beaten and disfigured, a man who no longer looked like a deliverer or a conqueror. And the attitude changed. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I want to encourage you, Palm Sunday 2021, choose to honor our great king. Choose to raise that hallelujah in, in your life. Choose to, to give your life and be Christ-centered in everything. We should give him our all. He demands our total allegiance to him. And when we live that way, our world will see a change. We will become transformed. We will become Christ-like. That's the first key of having a committed faith is to become Christ-like in every area of your life. But it doesn't end there. The second key is this faith, to have a committed faith, it's relationship-driven. Many who gathered 
and threw their coats and palm branches on the street that day, shouted praises because it was the popular thing to do at the time. For one brief moment, it might have been trendy. There might have been several in that crowd that threw their coat down or threw their their palm branch down because everybody else was doing it. They missed out on who Christ really is. And as I said, by the end of the week, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, which would have been the, the trendy thing to do. And probably several that yelled, crucify him, crucify him. You ever get caught up in a crowd? And you, and you realize, oh my goodness, I don't need to be here. There may have been some that just got caught up in the crowd and that were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. What we need to understand, in order to maintain that, that committed faith, that type of faith that, that, that Christ wants us to have, we must maintain a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, we could preach a whole other sermon on how do we develop a personal relationship with Jesus. Let me just say, if you do not think you have a personal relationship with Jesus, come talk to me. Come talk to Kara. Come talk to Sam, John, Steve, or Reagan, or anyone, or your Sunday school teacher. Because that is the, I can tell you, that is the most important decision that you will ever make. Come talk to us. Paul says, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get right with God. Come talk to us if you're not sure. So it's all about relationship. To have that committed faith, we have to realize that we're in an intimate love relationship with someone who loves us like no one else could ever love us. It's hard to believe that someone could love me unconditionally. The third key to having a committed faith is not to be swayed or blocked by personal trials or crises that we encounter in life. At the parade, it was trendy to offer praise. Everyone was doing it. To speak out of the tr- to speak out in, in, in support of Jesus was a risky thing to do, and it was probably life threatening at the time. Many of us come to Christ expecting everything to go good in our lives. That is not what Scripture says. Maybe some bad things have happened to us. Maybe when the bottom drops out. We often ask God why. And we say, why is this happening? Why must this happen this way? Let me read you something that's probably one of the most important things you'll hear today. If our faith is based on our situations or circumstances, it will never be committed. It will always be casual. In my life, I've gone to some big Christian events and come back fired up. I've gone to arenas where we've gone and worshiped God and and, and have left um, um, pumped up and ready to take on the world for Christ. But that fades shortly after. Our kids here at at Heritage, we go to Breakthrough. I went to Breakthrough. um, I was breaking through in 82. Um, um, that's sort of a joke. Some of y'all still laugh. Glad y'all are still laughing at that joke. Um, but um, our kids go to breakthrough. My youth minister growing up used to say this. He said, it doesn't stop. What are you going to do when you get off the bus after breakthrough? He said, you're on the spiritual high. And you talk about living for Jesus, being all that you can, for, for doing all that you can for Christ at this retreat. And he would always share with us, hey, when you get back home, it gets tough when you step off that bus. How many of us have been to things like that where we've experienced God like we've never, ever experienced him and we get back and we step off that bus and we go back to living the way that we live? Or when bad things happen, we go back to living the way we live. A committed faith takes the good and the bad. Knowing that all we were ever promised is that in the midst of the good and bad that we may experience, Jesus will never leave us, never forsake us. He will always stand with us. That's encouraging because what usually happens is we leave Jesus or we leave God when things get difficult. We must get to a place where where we know what God is doing and we're exactly where he wants us to be and we must trust him with our pressures, with our trials, with our difficulties. 
And when that comes, something beautiful happens. Jesus is there to minister to us, to carry us through. There have been things that I've gone through in my life, and there's been things that you have gone through in your life that were difficult, where you almost felt like that Jesus scooped you up and carried you. He is with us. A committed faith takes the good and the bad and realizes that God is always with us. Question for you this morning, is your faith committed or is it casual? As we approach this week where we talk about all that Christ did for us, all that he suffered for us, where our sins, our past, present, and future sins were the nails that hung Jesus on the cross, doesn't Jesus deserve a second look? Doesn't he deserve for us to be committed? Doesn't he deserve total control of our life? I think the problem is some of us are at the wrong parade. In their book, The Last Week, what the Gospels really teach about Jesus' last days in Jerusalem, New Testament scholars Marcus Borg and John Croson argued that two processions entered Jerusalem on that first, first Palm Sunday and that Jesus' entry was not the only triumphant entry. History records and reports, you see every year the Roman governor, and you can go ahead and put that other picture up if it'll show you, his records that the Roman governor, who at this time was Pontius Pilate, he did not live in Jerusalem. He would come to Jerusalem from his palace on the coast in Caesarea, and he wanted to be present for Passover. It's a Jewish festival. Jerusalem population was about 50,000. It swelled to about three to four times that during Passover. And the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, wanted to be where the action was. For several reasons. He came to put on a big show of power, wealth, glory. He came mainly to make sure the Jews would not start making any trouble. That's why he came to Jerusalem. To remind the Jews that Rome was in charge. Here's what they say. A description that we gather from history about Pontius Pilate's imperial possession. It was a visual show of imperial power. Cavalry on horses, foot shoulders, leather, armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun um, glistening off the metal and gold, sounds of marching feet, the creaking of leather, the creaking of bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust, the silent onlookers, some curious, some awe, and awe, some resentful. This is the background of which we get our Palm Story Sunday Parade of Jesus. As Pilate clanged and crashed his way into Jerusalem from the west, Jesus approached from the east, and his parade was much, much more different. This is what they write about Jesus' parade. He came on a barred donkey, not an imperial stallion. He came sur surrounded by a pretty ragtag bunch of disciples, a tax collector, fishermen, farmers. He came followed by crowds of people who he have touched and healed by the Son of God. He came followed by men whose eyes were made to see, women who had been healed after years, a woman who had been healed after years of bleeding, the lame who'd found their way to walk again, the dead who'd been brought back to life again. He came surrounded by the shouts of Hosanna, which means save us. There's a big difference. Jesus' parade was a sign of humbleness and meekness. Jesus came as the king of a strange type of kingdom where the first would be last, where the meek are powerful, where the meek shall inherit the earth, and where the kingdom of God belongs to the peacekeepers. He came to a kingdom who calls us to be committed followers and have a committed faith. 
So here's the thing. You can join this procession too. It's not a procession of military might. We know where Jesus' parade is heading. It's heading straight into Holy Week, straight into the eye of the storm, straight towards the cross. It's not a fun parade, but it's a self-sacrifice of love. That Paul, who wrote the Philippians, wrote this, that Jesus emptied himself. And that's what he did for us. We don't gather here this morning to go away feeling a warm fuzzy as we worship, as we sing. We gather to learn and reflect on how important it is to have a committed faith. We come to learn how important it is to, to, to live a Christ-centered life. We come to see that, that, that our faith is all about having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ. We come to learn that our faith can be strengthened through difficult circumstances and that God is always with us. There's two processions, two parades, two kingdoms. My question for you today, which one will you choose? Invite Reagan and the praise team to come up. And I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to be in the prayer room if anybody would like to pray. But as we enter into Holy Week, I hope you'll take every advantage and opportunity to, to, uh, to participate in our Holy Week uh, worship services this week. But ask yourself the question as you reflect upon today and upon this passage. Which parade do you choose? choose the parade of power and might and of military strength or do you choose the parade of a humble king that entered this week to die for you and for me let's pray Father God we thank you for this time that we can come together to worship God is my prayer that we'll be committed in every area of our lives for you Father God we love you you're so good to us. We thank you for carrying us through those difficult times, difficult circumstances that we've all experienced in life. Thank you for not leaving us alone. Even though at times it may seem that way, you're not the one who bells on us. And we thank you for that. God, as we enter into Holy Week, God, we celebrate what your son Christ did for each and every one of us. That alone should be enough to live a committed life for you. God, convict us where we need conviction. Make us the type of person you want us to be as we develop and, and, and be, to become more Christ-like. To realize that our relationship with you is, is relationship-driven. God, just grow us and help us be the person that you want us to be, Father. God, we love you. God, as we enter into this holy week, help us to truly raise a hallelujah. And maybe share the message of your love to others just a little bit louder. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. invite our ushers to come forward to take our offering at this time.
Thanks so much, Reagan and Praise Man. That, that was awesome. And hey, I'm glad y'all were here today because that was some good preaching, wasn't it, Scott? Uh, that, that parallel between Pilate and coming in on a, a white stallion and bringing his power and victory versus Jesus riding in on a donkey or a colt. And I, I think kind of like what Scott was saying, we, man, we can choose to live in a kingdom that is, has already fallen, or we can choose to humble ourselves and follow the way of Jesus. And so I'd encourage you to reflect on that today. I've actually never heard about Pilate's in, uh, entry like that, and so I appreciate Scott for finding that and sharing that with us. But y'all think about that as we go this week. Which one, which parade are you going to join? So as we do that, let's prepare our hearts for what's happening next week. What's happening next week, the resurrection and Easter. And we hope that you'll join us back for that. Uh, as we close, remember, y'all help us move these chairs to the side and some in the narthex. Uh, but I hope y'all have a blessed week and we'll see you back here. Six o'clock sunrise and 10 o'clock outside. Y'all have a good week.